I'm not sure. I think some people are still trying to get in. All right, okay. So maybe I, we I, wait another five minutes. With these few minutes, maybe other people will start to come in as well. And so, yeah, good morning and good evening to everyone online for our webinar series. Um, my name is Mingye Rongsley, representing the International Journal of Taiwan Studies here at this event. And this series of cultural salon webinars are co-organized by uh, International Journal of Taiwan Studies and also North American Taiwan Studies Association, European Association of Taiwan Studies, or Japan, uh, Japan Association for Taiwan Studies. Um, so we are hoping, you know, for today's talk um, from Taiwanese language films to the future of Taiwan cinema will facilitate a very fruitful discussion. Um, prior to the event, we already sent uh, quite detailed uh, proposals of this event, uh, our speakers' uh, short biography and also the talks they are going, uh, they are going to, um, the topic they are going to talk about. So I will not repeat everything that we already stated in email once again. Um, but in terms of today's proceedings, what we'll do is that we will invite Professor Chris Berry to speak uh, first um, to give us a broader overview about the reflection on the event that he has organized by bringing a Taiwanese language cinema to UK and Europe for, uh, for screening and discussion for several years. And after uh, Chris's talk, we'll then have Professor Ji Dawei from um, National Zhengzhi University to talk about the representation of disability in Tai Yu Pian and also in Taiwan cinema today. Followed by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Corrado Neri from Lyon 3 University. And Corrado will also look closely at uh, Taiwan cinema and um, especially about during Y Terra era. And black cinema, I think. Right. Um, but finally, we will also have Professor Robert Chen from National Zhengzhi University, again, to give us a more broad uh, overview, uh, looking at the future of Taiwan cinema, including um, um, his observation of the most recent Golden War. And so the purpose of this cultural salon really to facilitate um, uh, vibrant discussions uh, on the subject that we're interested in. So you can see we uh, in the chat box, we already type in all the questions that we have received so far. Anybody have answers or comments, also welcome to type in chat uh, box. So we will, you know, whoever can, maybe we'll start discussion and answers. And at the same time, we will also listen to our presenters. So without further ado, we'll invite Chris to give our first talk. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Mingye. And thank you everybody for coming along today. Um, I'm gonna to try to do the share screen thing now and we'll see if I can get it to work. It did in the rehearsal, but you never know if it will in reality. So now let me go, okay. There I am. So I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes, I think. And uh, what I'm going to try and do is just offer a few reflections on my experience over the last uh, four years or so, maybe five years, of introducing Taiwanese language cinema, Tai Yupian, in the UK and Europe, the rest of Europe as um, Mingye was saying. And I should emphasize that um, from the beginning of the project, I was working with Mingye on this, and its most recent iteration, uh, I've also been working with Corrado and uh, with Wafa Germani from the Cinémathèque Française. And uh, among our guests at the academic symposiums we've had has been Robert and many other scholars. Um, so, um, you know, the, when I look back on this now, 
of course, I wonder uh, why we took on this thing, because it's really quite a challenge to get people to come along and watch old black and white movies they never heard of from a country that they confuse with Thailand and with subtitles on it, you know? So um, I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, but um, we did have a go. And in the process, we set up a website and I've put the uh, details on there. So if you are interested in knowing more <clears throat> in more detail about the films we screened, the directors, um, where they went, all the cities and so on, you can find them on this website. Um, and uh, for this tour, um, we all these two tours, I should say, in 2017, 18, and then again this year and next year. What we're focusing on is the phenomenon of uh, Taiwanese language cinema, which is langu cinema in the Minnanhua Sinitic language, which is the language spoken on Taiwan uh, by the, the Chinese ethnic population that was there before 1945 and the end of Japanese colonialism. Um, these films began to be made in the late 1950s. There were no films being made regularly, feature films being made regularly on Taiwan before that. And between the late 50s and the early 70s, over a thousand of these films were made by a variety of mostly quite small, undercapitalized companies, um, many of which went bankrupt quite quickly. And then television and various other factors led to the rapid ending of the Taiwanese language cinema industry in the early 1970s, and they got rapidly forgotten. And when I first encountered Taiwanese cinema, or cinema from Taiwan, maybe I should say, I never really heard about this. Nobody ever told me about this phenomenon. So um, in terms of why I wanted to show these films, um, for myself, it was just professional curiosity. Um, in most countries, when you have uh, the, the first, the earliest sustained production, there's a lot of curiosity in that, about that locally, or a celebration and historians writing about it and so on. And so I was kind of interested in this neglect for such a long time. And the films themselves were not very accessible. So to be honest with you, purely selfish reason, getting the films here was a way for me to see more of them and to try to understand more about them. Now that we've been showing them around Europe, uh, I think I can reflect a little bit on the responses we're getting from audiences and also all the discussions we've been having because we've had various lectures and academic events. And I would say there are two other main sort of trends or trajectories for why audiences and other people find the films interesting. And one I think that is quite important is that by now in the film festival world and beyond it, it's not only auteurs and not only art cinema that attract interest. Most of these films are low budget genre films. Some of them are a little bit wacky, like the one you can see a picture from here on the screen, which looks like sort of early cosplay, but in fact is a kind of fable. Um, mostly they're melodramas, spy movies, comedies, and so on. And now I think there's a lot of interest in the cinephile world in those kinds of films, as well as in auteur films. And we found a lot of uh, welcome from people who are interested in discussing genre cinema, how genre films trend, trends travel across the world, and so on. And then I think the other interest really is for people who want to understand more about Taiwan and its history, uh, particularly during the martial law era, the 38 years of martial law uh, from the late 40s, 1949 to 1987. During that period, of course, there was a lot of control over media and other culture. And so 
um, it's difficult to get a sense of uh, culture that is not government, strongly government controlled. Now, it's true that, of course, these films also had to go through censorship, but they are not originating in government owned studios. They're originating mostly in private companies, and that creates a difference. It's also interesting because uh, due to low budgets, they were often shot on the ordinary on the streets um, and in the countryside around Taipei. And so you get inadvertently a kind of look at what the ordinary streets looked like at that time. I think we also get a sense of uh, just how cosmopolitan uh, Taiwanese culture already was in the 1960s. The films uh, do things like make local 007 movies, they ref use Japanese Enka music, they adapt from English novels, um, they reference uh, all kinds of different uh, pop cultural trends from all over the world. Um, but of course, because this is the Cold War era, they don't include any trends, any pop culture, from the socialist bloc. It's Cold War cosmopolitanism, as uh, Christine Klein calls it in her uh, work. Now, um, I now would like to reflect a little bit more on the experience of trying to get this event to happen. And it led me to have some reflections about promoting Taiwanese culture in Europe now. And I think to understand this, we need to think about what Ragan Ryan in her famous article has called the stakeholder configuration. When you're thinking about a special film event, a festival uh, or screenings, who are the stakeholders and what do they, uh, and, and getting the right configuration of stakeholders is crucial for success. So right from the beginning, I was interested, other academics interested in Taiwanese film wanted this to happen. The Taiwan Film and Audiovisual Institute, of course, was eager to, to support this. And so was the Taiwan Representative's Office and its cultural division in London. And I'm grateful to them for their support. But it was more difficult, really, to find local venues. And before this first iteration of the series in 2017, I thought I would be able to get the film screened at a suitable festival, um, a European festival specialized in Asian films, perhaps, that did retrospective sidebars. And what I found for a couple of years before this was I kept asking people and they kept saying they were interested, but then nothing ever happened. And so in the end, I decided, OK, let's just do this in the universities using DVDs. And so for the first iteration in 2017, we screened at 10 universities in the UK and about 10 more across Europe. And now, with the benefit of hindsight, I have a better understanding of why um, those other uh, venues like film festivals and cinematechs didn't want to do it. Um, I thought that, uh, especially if we were offering support, they didn't have to pay much to do it. It would be something that they would be eager to take on board. But I now realize that the idea that, um, for example, the BFI South Bank here in London, which is our equivalent of a national cinematech, or uh, one of the Asian film festivals in Europe would sort of pioneer this was a mistake. They're not places you go anymore to discover new things because they are not supported in the way they used to be. And so even though they may not be having to pay a lot for the films, it costs them a lot to run their venues and they need to sell tickets in a way that they maybe didn't need to before. But I'm pleased to say that once we did this season in 2017, and then a bunch of new films came along and we were able to repeat it um, this last couple of years, we still had our university partners, but suddenly we found that both the specialist film festivals and the national cinematechs that we 
were disappointed by before were suddenly much more interested. So I think on reflection, we can conclude that from doing this very, if you will, low rent, low budget, maybe that's appropriate for Thai UPN, kind of cultural activity the first time, where we were just in DVDs and using university lecture halls, which don't cost us anything to use, we were able to make universities function as a kind of cultural incubator to make Thai UPN something that was on the horizon of cinephile organizations, on the horizon of specialist film festivals, cinematechs, and so on, in a way that it wasn't before. And even if it's just a little tiny bit, that's enough to get them to think, OK, so maybe this is a thing. Maybe we should take a bit of interest in it. So, of course, COVID has intervened. So the screenings we were hoping to do this year, many of them haven't happened. But I'm pleased to say that we managed to get um, a continuation into next year. And so if you haven't been able to see any of these films, go to that website. I'll go back to the beginning, just in case. There you are, www.tiupn.uk. And just link up to the tour page and you'll find where it's going to be screening. And you can keep an eye out and see if you can catch it at a venue near you sometime next year. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Right, so Chris will stand by and maybe there will be questions online now. But meanwhile, we will just move our um, microphone to uh, that way. So here you are, that way. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh, I can okay. hear you now. I thought you disappeared. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And uh, because our time is limited, so if you have uh, any further questions, uh, maybe you can uh, message me on uh, Instagram. <laughs> and I know that um, uh, it is more um, fashionable than uh, Facebook now. Here and I would like to uh, tell you that tell everybody that uh, actually I'm new to the field of Taiwan uh, Tai Taiwanese uh, language film uh, Tai Yu Pian, and I'm so fascinated with the archive of Tai Yu Pian because I find it's so useful for people like me. Um, I have uh, studied. Uh, I have done gender studies, disability studies, and I really need uh, uh, various historical archives and i find that the, the tai yu pian archive is actually very useful very informative and it shows that uh, uh, shows um, many sides characters um, issues bodies and everyday life that i didn't see before in other archives that's why i find that it's very useful to uh, to my teaching and to my research and i really encourage courage other colleagues and students and friends all the world uh, to enjoy the uh, archive of Tai Yu Pian as well. And I find that the, some friends are, uh, uh, colleagues are interested in knowing why we pay attention to Tai Yu Pian. Uh, I think that the, for me, I find that it's fascinating to see the uh, depictions, representations of certain marginalized figures, um, actually numer numerous, marginalized figures in history, such as uh, uh, lower class women, um, of course, lower class men as well, and uh, uh, especially disability, uh, people with disabilities. And um, um, I find that um, um, actually many uh, historians and discussions of Tai Yu Pian already mention uh, disabilities in their discussions but they usually mention them in pacing. However, however, I think that we can spend, we can uh, invest more um, 
attention and uh, uh, develop some, some more discussions on them because um, as, ma as many uh, know it, Ta uh, Taiwanese society is also paying more attention to the rights and uh, to the communities of uh, people with disabilities. But uh, many of them don't, many of us don't know that. In fact, we can look at the history of uh, Tai Yu Pian to explore what happened to uh, people uh, who think about disabilities, who experience the disabilities in the um, in the earlier periods. And first of all, I would like to mention this to you. This film is very extremely famous. Um, in English, it's called uh, uh, Made, Woman, Made Woman for 80 Years, made in 1957, and uh, it's called Fonu uh, Spanian. This film might be actually one of the most famous Tai Yu Pian in history. On a um, woman of mental disability. And uh, uh, it's a pity that the film is not available now and uh, we cannot, um, the film itself is lost. We cannot see the film itself, but uh, we can still find that uh, some later or some related discussions and uh, gossip about the film. And uh, it's useful for us to imagine why people in the 50s would be so interested in the story of a made woman. And after that, I would like to mention the film. It's also, um, in fact, uh, one of the most famous uh, popular Tai Yu Pian films called Early Train from Taipei. Uh, in Chinese, it is, in Mandarin, it is uh, Taipei. Um, it was made in 1960. And currently is uh, maybe one of the best known Tai Yu Pian in and outside Taiwan. Uh, I would like to, the, the, although the film is basically understood as a love tragedy between a woman and a man, and then the man, uh, the woman, um, the tragedy uh, is tragic because uh, the two characters cannot get together because uh, one major reason is that the, both of them. Uh, Uh, the woman, uh, the female characters in the in the film has her face is uh, transfigured by uh, chemicals, and the the guy in the uh, the guy she loves becomes blinded because uh, he is hit uh, uh, he is beat up by by some gangsters in the film, and uh, in the film I see that uh, the. The film actually, the lens of the film actually pays much attention to the um, um, the difficulties of the two non-normal bodies of the two characters, and uh, it's uh, it's very engaging. It's very informative to for me to know that uh, okay, so at that time in the cities, imagine and portray people with disabilities that like that. And uh, I and and I find that uh, actually um, some of the portrayals are realistic enough. And after early train from Taipei, I would like to move on to uh, encounter at the station. Encounter of the station, a film um, uh, from 1965. Uh, Nanwang de Nanwang de is a uh, um, encounter of the station is also a very famous and popular um, melodrama, also a kind of comic, uh, tragic um, melodrama. And I would like to point out that the film is so popular, partly, partly because um, it's very sensational. And uh, it's sensational because the two lovers in the film also become disabled. And uh, the guy um, becomes uh, uh, insane after uh, he is uh, separated from the woman and he is sent to an asylum in Japan to seek, tour, to seek a cure. And uh, the, the, the heroine, the woman in the film, 
actually experiences one of the first eye surgeries in uh, Chinese cinema. And uh, she, um, uh, and uh, uh, she, anyway, she, um, at the first, she lost her eyesight because of overwork. And after that, she received a surgery and uh, uh, got back her vision. And I find that it's, um, um, it's use useful for us to know that people in, Ta uh, people in Taiwan in 1975 already uh, uh, expected the uh, magical cure of uh, eye surgeries. And I think that maybe that um, such surgeries were very, uh, meant a lot to people at that time. And um, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have uh, much time left, but the, um, after the, uh, uh, the three films, I would like to mention a very contemporary one. Uh, some, um, some of the friends online uh, tell us that they also, also want to know what's going on in uh, Chinese cinema now. I would like to mention the film, um, The Silent Forest. Uh, Wu Shen uh, is uh, um, one of the most uh, uh, highly acclaimed films in uh, this year, and uh, it got uh, I think that the two uh, two two awards from Jin Ma Jiang, the Golden Horse um, Award, and uh, the film is um, actually is very controversial and sensational and highly debatable. It uh, portrays um, and those um, at a school for deaf students, and uh, the students are seriously. Uh, many of the students are seriously abused, sexually abused by their classmates and the uh, And uh, the film, um, and uh, I find that the film, the film is um, is very is worth attention because the film there is no. Uh, um, uh, any there is no big cast in the film, but the film is extremely um, successful commercially and uh, uh, more or less critically as well. And then many young viewers in Taiwan um, uh, go to watch the film because they are they feel so relatable. They are so concerned with um, the rights of uh, uh, people with disabilities now, and uh, of course because. Uh, they are concerned with the the me, uh, me too issue. That's why uh, the film uh, uh, is actually a, a huge box uh, success, box uh, office success in Taiwan. So we see that uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, throughout the Taiwanese film history, we can see that the many, uh, not so many films uh, portray disabilities, but uh, there are uh, always some highlights across history. And uh, uh, I will go back to some other samples if we have time later. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dawei, for this very interesting talk. Thank uh, yeah, you. I watched most of the films you mentioned, but yes, only today actually I started to think about. You're right, actually, they the highlight of disability, and for some reason I just didn't think about that. So thank you. Thank um, you. So we will now move to Corrado. Um, so, Corrado, just a reminder us, actually, his talk today will focus more on future rather than past. So, that actually make a very good linkage. Yeah, so linking from Dawei's uh, discussion to yours, and then finally we will move to Robert. So, that's make very good logic. Thank you. So, move to you now. Thanks. So, just a second, I try to share. Am I sharing? Yes. Am I? Am I sharing? Yes, yes. I can see. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, uh, Am I sharing? It's good. Oh. Yeah, well, okay, thank you. So, as I was saying, I was I got some inspiration. So I'll try to talk about Taiwanese language film, but also and maybe especially about well, future. I don't see the future, but maybe the the heritage of Taiwanese language film in today, 
uh, into their movies with a specific focus, as you see, on horror movie. I'll just say right now, horror movie, I, I focus on this genre, obviously because I like it a lot, but also because it's one of the more successful uh, path um, of Taiwanese cinema now. Not the only one, of course. It's just one case study, not the only one, or, and neither the, the most important, but to my, in my idea, one of the most interesting. So, um, uh, why came this, this idea that which is also really open to question and discussion? Um, the idea is, I'm, I'm linking immediately with uh, Professor Barry uh, talk and, and, and that Tai Yu Pian, and, and this, uh, he, he uh, extensively talked about this enterprise. And I think one of the strategies, at least when we show this in Lyon, uh, part of the Tai Yu, uh, tai Yu Pian uh, tour, one of the strategies to attract uh, public and, and scholar interest in the Restore Taiwan cinema is to underscore their provocative and oppositional agenda with keywords like cult movie, counterculture, alternative uh, movies. And it's, I think it's extremely interesting now because contemporary audience can discover under often heavily moralistic overtones, intriguing representation of the devious, and by devious, of course, I hyphenate, and, and maybe it can be also linked to uh, Jida Wei uh, presentation we, we had uh, right now. Devious, not normal, and, and of course everything is, is, is uh, uh, hyphenated. Uh, alternative and pricing form of six, of sin and sex, they get together, crime and uh, exploitation. It's interesting, again, as an echo of what we, we've been saying, maybe to see this film as a, a, a reverse shot to the official uh, Central Motion Picture Company uh, production, helping contemporary viewers to complicate our understanding of Taiwanese martial law, cinema and culture. With this, uh, and I go back, well, uh, at Haipien.uk uh, has been, has been uh, mentioned, but I also want to um, bring to attention other forms of, um, sorry, that's not, it, yeah, here. Uh, and this is also just, just a note other forms of uh, repatrimonialization of Taiwan uh, B movies. Like this is a, is a splendid pre Christmas gift from the uh, one it, it's, uh, it's open for free online until, uh, until December 15, as you can see. And it's, um, it, it's an overlook with a film, movies, um, uh, subtitle, and uh, documentaries, and different interventions, including academic intervention. So we see that in Taiwan, there is this very interesting uh, drive to re-patrimonialize these movies that were perceived as B-movies, which are movies, but enter now into this museification, or at least uh, re-valorization in terms of uh, patrimony, cultural uh, patrimony. Yeah, so I just mentioned this idea. I use this uh, uh, Jean Davalon uh, uh, definition of re-patrimonialization of uh, B-movies. So, the, that's why I, I'm shifting to the future somehow, or present, let's say. So I'd like to bridge this uh, 60s, 70s production of Tai Yupian to today. And I've got some question to myself, um, and of course, <laughs> the audience and other participants. Um, tai Yupian, what kind of relevance, legacy, transformation in contemporary war um, maybe it's provocative, but can we talk today about Tai Yu Pian? I would say no, and then yes and no. Why no? Well, because the dichotomy of uh, Tai Yu and Guo Yu, which was very strong in the 60s and 70s, uh, there were films dubbed in Guo Yu or um, in, in uh, Tai Yu. I'm very well aware that there are other languages in Taiwan that are used here now, not much in the 60s and 70s. I think there is also, of course, a political and social wave change that, that, that bring today the plurilinguism in the movies. I, I mean, except some 
films like Li Xing, uh, Liang Xianghao, very few were uh, working with uh, the plurilingual uh, status of Taiwanese film. Today is much more the rules, also because of, of course, as I said, political, but technical. Uh, not many movies are today paying, dubbed. So it is much more technically feasible and acceptable to hear mixed source of uh, languages. So if maybe it's hard to talk about Tai Yu Pian today, yet there are an important legacy of these movies in what sense, in what terms? Industry, aesthetics, consumption, consumption, sorry, and memories. Uh, I'm just reading key word. I'm not very good in articulating. One is guilty pleasure, and, and maybe can, can link to the idea of how do we uh, attire a movie, guilty pleasure of watching horror here, but spy movie, uh, grassroots uh, comedy, etc. Low budget, local market, we are discussing now in this global salon, but we can say that um, uh, there are many films that are made for the local market in terms of uh, innuendo, um, folklore, local culture, inside jokes. Uh, I'm going to show some, uh, some um, example um, in a few seconds. Also, not festival movie, the movies I'm going to talk about, they didn't really participate in a lot of, 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 of international festivals, some to the gymnasium. Grassroots or bad taste, genre movie, I know there were, of course, Mandarin genre movie, uh, Wuxia Pian and, and musical, but uh, Tai Yu Pian, many Tai Yu Pian were like grassroots comedy, spy movie, horror, bad manner, etc. And of course, all these movies are shaping national identity, popular taste, sound and visual frame of reference, so aesthetics. Briefly, panorama of what I, what I see as forms of heritage of Taiwan film in horror, again, just a case study, relevant in my sense. And I propose two um, categories, which are, of course, overlapping. Political horror, local horror, and I finish with a coda with with art or highbrow. Political horror, then. The most immediate and obvious uh, example is uh, Detention, a fan xiao movie, video game, now uh, Yin Ji, a TV show uh, on, on, on the Netflix platform, at least in Europe. This film, as you are aware, is an adaptation of a video game. Uh, it's situated during martial law Taiwan, it's discussing uh, the forbidden books, uh, Tagore, in the TV show, uh, which is set in the early 2000s, Brave New World and 1984, languages, what was supposed to be spoken, what was heard at the time, uh, what was forbidden. So there are questions related also to, to languages and languages, culture, society, and, and, and the like. Some uh, features of Taiwanese cinema, grassroots experience, plurilingualism, relevant to today's discussion on transitional justice, history, legacy, national identity, but also aesthetics. We found here gloomy yet beautiful magnified Taiwan mountain landscape, high school uniform aesthetics, the rooftop of the school, which is the siege of love and hate and death and call for freedom, as well as global horror. Uh, infused with Japan horror tricks, long-haired women ghosts, play with technology and tradition, uh, I'll go back here in a second, reflecting surfaces, grey, green, shadowy, Fuji film uh, tones. Other political horror, oh yeah, so the, 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 the Netflix uh, um, declination of this franchise. Other political uh, horror, um, very recent, uh, Get the Hell Out, with a much more telling title in Chinese, they are to Tao Chu Li Fai Yuan, which has immediately a political undertones. Um, it's, it's a zombie movie, a zombie invasion in a, a chaotic and over the top um, legislative uh, Yuan. I also like to um, bring your attention briefly to a para film or 
uh, the website actually dedicated to the official website if he wants yes he does dedicated to this film of again for a question of time and just just show a few images but I, I, I urge you to go and check it out and um, explore it is maybe even more interesting than the film itself and we have on another uh, page of the website a very interesting mockery of course over the top and and and, and, and a completely postmodern but an interesting reflection uh, of again grassroots movement movements political activism rudeness or mauvais genre uh, in french i'm echoing a retrospective of the cinematheque française so bad taste uh, film. Future of Taiwan cinema, of course not all Taiwanese movies are going to follow this example, hopefully I might say, but uh, there are very interesting um, characteristics. So here is again a, a shot from um, our Tao Chu Li Yuan. And it also reminds me, especially the website I've just shown you, the um, Japanese uh, super flat aesthetic, kawaii, graphic art, consumerism, pop and kitsch, post-modern uh, declination of horror. Category overlapping, of course, local horror, a very recent and very interesting example is this uh, is this film the, the the titles also are really interesting for the international audience we have a kind of explicit um declaration we are talking about gangs so triad mafia um with all the paraphernalia linked to to the mafia and yakuza which is japanese i'm sorry word the oscar because these people want to make a movie and and, and then they aim to the Oscar. So it's a cinephilia. Um, it's a cinephilia. Uh, Professor Barry just mentioned this, this new non autorist cinephilia. We are here. We are, by the way, this is an example, I think, of this non autorist cinephilia, Huai Jiu, retro vintage. While in Chinese, Jianghu, well, yes, we are in the, the gangs or, uh, well, you know what Jianghu means. Um, and well, this comes from an article from the news lens, but I'd like just to show you, I literally have 40 seconds of this movie and 40 seconds, please allow me. This is almost, oops, where, what am I doing? Nothing. Uh, almost at the beginning of the movie and it's uh, linked with postmodern pop, cinephilia and Tai Yu. So let's go. <laughs> Okay, 老魔扎波老师戏码会矮的 Okay, and then it goes. So the story of the movie, as we've seen, is a movie buff um, who wants to, to make a movie, and it will be a movie with uh, with Walking Dead, with zombies, so a horror a movie or horror comedy. What we have seen in this few seconds is an ex sorry. It's an extremely uh, rich, I mean, we can really stop in these 40 seconds that I've, I've shown you and link it with a, a, a huge pun of Japanese uh, culture, including, for example, well, we have the same actor in, the, in both movies, but this Forever Love, which is Amada Manzong Chingre, it's a, a vocation of the making of, of the Taiwan uh, movies. So it's a contemporary movie reconstructing the, 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 the playful universe an imagined universe of Taiwan movies, but also this uh, manhua, uh, Xiao Zhuang, Come on. Cut your mic, please. Thanks. Cut mic, sorry, thanks. And so this Ba Sen Nian Dai make me think of, well, it's a different thing, of course, but this, um, 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 Jianghu Nangsi, Wu Nangsi, and this short um, seconds made me think of this 
autobiographical uh, cartoon. This is like the Huaijiu and, and Cinephilia. Uh, so this paraphernalia of vintage retro object, here we go exactly in the um, uh, bookshop where he is, by the way, looking for APN. So uh, video store, clothes, TV and phone, beepers, all link to this common popular culture, grassroots memories, imagine communities and, and common culture background. In this final, final, I mean, in this, in this few sequence, we also, you have, uh, oops, sorry, you have seen, we have a reference to the Jiang Shi movie and they do, obviously, here we go, and they do obviously come from uh, Hong Kong, uh, which is another uh, idea of Professor Berry just mentioned, this Cold War cosmopolitanism of uh, Taiwan, where Hong Kong movies were, of course, part of, uh, of the cultural DNA of popular DNA. Other movies, um, of local, are the series of Hong Yi Xiao Nu Hai. You have the third one here, which is a completely different folklore evocation. And in these uh, movies, as director Chen Weihao uh, underscore here, uh, we have urban legend, folklore, Hong Yi comes from a very particular and, and very popular uh, TV show. So uh, linking these uh, global horror uh, fashion to local uh, culture, expression, folklore, um, superstition. Other most even the most recent movie i mean i haven't seen the second one which is out which was released uh, this summer but has a huge box office uh, impact and in this uh, movie as well we have a evocation a reconstruction of uh, a, a, a ritual and i was reading it on the china post and i'm quoting here uh, Rob Kerr's deal with the uh, Song Rao Tong ritual, sending rice dumplings, prevalent in coastal Changhua, where Taoist priests purified the soul of someone who hanged himself. Locals believe that if the ritual is not concluded, this, the deceased will remain in the human world, searching for someone to take his place. Perhaps due to the success of the first film, this ritual has actually gained popularity in recent years and has spread to other areas of Taiwan. Residents are not happy about this because they feel that the ritual, which has never been a full tradition where they live, brings them bad luck. <laughs> it's also interesting to, to, to see this invented trans, trans tradition and imagined community and how the media, the cinema here, helps to uh, modify, invent, reshuffle, rekindle uh, local uh, tradition. And modernity is always there. In the first one, the first installation of the movie, we have a live feed um, uh, broadcast uh, that want to film the ritual in order to get some likes. Technology and, and, and folklore or tradition comes here very obviously in the, um, uh, in the poster itself, where we have an iPhone filming or trying to film a ghost. And there is also a very, very interesting and, and, uh, line in the movie where the protagonist let his uh, iPhone uh, drop his iPhone and there might be a ghost somewhere. And he goes, hey, Siri, turn the screen light up to the brightest. So he literally calls Google for, for help. And the question is, modernity, the live stream technology is able to decipher or dispel an ancient curse, or on the contrary, new technology can help carry curses, ghosts, and their relic. So this is another form of, of, of heritage, I would say, or a continuity of Tai uh, Pian. These, I just show the, um, the poster, Jiu Ba Dao, Lao Si Bao Gao, and um, Secret of the Hospring are declination of horror that tackles social reality as a school hazing uh, and military past, martial law. And here we go, obviously, with the Japanese uh, heritage or hunting of local or contemporary Taiwan. 
So to arrive to a conclusion, but I've got a, a very, very last uh, coda, are these new Taiyupian? As I said at the beginning, I would say yes, no, but it's really open question. Uh, no, because they're not only uh, Taiyu, they're completely linked to a global uh, making of horror movie. I'll just mention the, the Netflix large investment in, in contemporary Taiwan movies. But there are some things that might be seen as a legacy of that period. Some theme, some obsession, the use of languages, uh, so Taiyu among others, bad manners, a resolute engaging with genre rules. So these are horror movies and they go for it. Um, iconoclasm, critique, especially if you see the Tao uh, Chuli Fai Yuan, disrespect or or, or, or critique versus uh, established moral and social codes, commercial enterprises aimed to gather local public. So I would say this can be seen as form of reincarnation of the spirit of the Thai Yupian. I promise the coda, last two minutes. It's not for everyone taste, uh, gritty, bad manner, horror movie, so I was very intrigued by this article about a movie that is Malaysian and I haven't seen it because it's very recent, it's just immediate, it's this year and the, the movie had some eyes of the Jim Azian, but I was really intrigued by, the, it's like Ho Xiao Xian Pai Pai Kong Bu Pian or Tai Mi Liang Pai Pai Nega, we've just seen uh, uh, the role curse. So is it possible imagining a highbrow art declination of horror movies? Yes, I think, and especially as an example, these two movies by Chong Mong Hong. One is, as the title clearly uh, addressed, a story of a domain of a possible uh, possession, a demon possession, and the other one, the Se Zhang Hua, there's a ghost, and it is a ghost story, even if both assume the role of the art festival movies in terms of elliptic narration, um, uh, uh, deep focus, slow rhythm, etc. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Corrado. Yeah, thank you for bringing us our attention to this new trend of the Taiwan filmmaking. Um, so yeah, without further ado, we'll go to Robert for making your conclusion, you know, looking at the future of Taiwan cinema. Thank you. I cannot hear you, Robert. Is it okay now? Good. Okay, yes, yeah, let me start again. Now. Good. Yeah, let me start again. Um, very nice to be here. And then um, I would like to move away from the discussion of Thai European or Taiwanese language cinema and then talking about my own observations about recent Taiwan cinema. And I'm going to divide it uh, my observations into four points. And this, the first one is about the rise of new auteurs. Because I noticed there are new and young auteurs appearing on Taiwan cinema. And you can see from this page, uh, including directors such as Wei De Sen, Zhong Meng Hong, Lin Su Yu, uh, Zheng Yu Jie, and uh, Huang Xing Yao. Um, they are all recognized by Golden Horse nomination or winning awards. And at the same time, the box office records for their films are quite good in um, in Taiwan's market, in Taiwan's domestic market, comparing with other Taiwan's films. And their subject matters are different, but most importantly, they are not like those highbrow uh, masters of previous generations, such as Ho Xiaoxian, Edward Yang, Andy, or Cai Ming Liang. Uh, their films are much more art oriented. But for those new generation filmmakers, they are making movies with box office in their minds. And in addition, 
their stories are more personal uh, in their their films deal with everyday life and i would say that later actually they focus more on local issue local stories rather than historical or political events so that makes a big difference between uh, those masters in a new cinema a new taiwan cinema movement and their own generations and then so it then comes to my second observations about uh, genre uh, generated transformations i notice or this is a current trend nowadays uh, starting from uh, Brugate Crossing, uh, Lanzo Daman, up to the films, there are so many films about rite of passage, about high school memories, and the, the subject issues deal with love and friendship among their classmates. So it goes back to Winds of September, and then You Are the Apple of My Eye, and then Our Time, and then the recent one is engraved here in, in uh, 2020. Those films, uh, stories actually most of those films are directors personal memories about their high school years and also about their um, rite of passages and also um, on the other hand I also noticed that um, new directors explore, explore new genres such as horror films which has been uh, thoroughly discussed by uh, Corrado and then I list here um, like uh, the Tag Along series or uh, New Gui Chao. So this actually um, Taiwan directors are not good at um, dealing with horror genre, but I find out new uh, new directors, they are able to deal with uh, this kind of uh, horror genre. And at the same time, the source materials for those new horror films come from Taiwan's local legends. They are able to adopt those local uh, horror stories or local um, legends into films. So Tag Along series actually is a very everlasting uh, stories about that uh, small girl ghost story, that kind of thing appearing uh, on and on again in our uh, newspaper or any uh, kind of hearsay about these stories. So I find out um, Nowadays, the new, new directors, they um, don't really look back to the past about what happened uh, in uh, Taiwan's history uh, or about the, the identity issue, identity problems being presented in the new Taiwan cinema movement. They are more focusing on their own personal stories and they look for local stories to be, uh, to draw their, to present their film so that the audience can feel related and also feel close to those films. And then the next point I'm going to talk about is IP. Um, detention has been uh, discussed by Corrado and and you can notice that here it used to be a video game or computer game and then it's adopted into film and then uh, in um, in again later on it been nowadays it been adopted into a TV series. So um, we we can see that in um, in our Netflix and also in our public television stations, and at the same time it becomes a new um, a business model. There's a escape game, escape room game for detention, so that people can play with that kind of game. So um, this is a new trend, and it's very popular among um, uh, those uh, Chinese language cinemas in um, in. Uh, China or in Hong Kong, uh, a lot of uh, film companies and also film directors try to develop the idea of IP, try to find our uh, source materials on um, video game or computer game and then try to adopt it. And then they have, since those uh, computer game or video games have their audience, and so they think it's possible to transfer those uh, uh, video game or computer game lovers move into uh, film so that they will be watch the film again. So, and then um, and lastly, I would like to talk about the idea of localism. Um, this idea actually, uh, I borrow it from EA and also uh, David Arrow. They define films made during the new Taiwan cinema movement or nativism. 
because most of those films were adapted from the nativist literature, Xiangtu Wenxue, such as novel by Huang Chunmin. So uh, novels by Huang Chunmin or those uh, nativist movies, they their stories were mainly about rural people, about um, what happened in the in the past. Uh, some uh, it's like a pre-modern era of Taiwan, and then um, during the agricultural society and what happened to those uh, ordinary people. But on the other hand, after the new Taiwan cinema movement, there comes a new trend, and those new films present Taiwan in a new way. For instance, in uh, Island Attitude, uh, in Zhou Mingqu, it encourages the audience to travel uh, by uh, feet or by uh, bicycle or by motorcycle to circle around Taiwan. So it encourages people to, it's like rediscover Taiwan again. And by traveling around Taiwan, they recognize, they start believing that Taiwan is their own homes. So it's a new way to uh, find out Taiwan is like a, another documentary called Kan Jian Taiwan, uh, so seeing Taiwan in a new perspective. And also uh, in um, in Over Taipei, uh, in this film, uh, it presents us a different way of looking at Taipei, especially because in that film, there's only one scene, only one scene showing 101 buildings. And so it's like uh, uh, we, uh, we are given another way, another new look at uh, Taipei, and so that we will be able to uh, rediscover Taipei again. And also another important example is Zhongpo Sai. Zhongpo Sai brings up a very traditional Taiwan local culture, which is Taiwan cuisine, including Bando and also uh, Liu Sui Xi Mu Feast. These are very local issues. But they will be able, or the director Chen Yuxin is able to bring the, bring up that issue, and then audience, because in their daily life they are so familiar with this kind of Taiwan cuisine or the way we uh we have that that kind of banquet, uh the the, the bando or that kind of uh, customs, so that uh once again audience feel related to uh Zhongpo side, related to those stories. Um, happening in, in these films. And and then um, let me move to another film with Gospit um, and also uh, Buddha Plus. In both films, the directors are able to let us see a uh, different scenery and rarely presented on big screen, such as uh, a very poor and uh, ruler and local county as Yunlin Xian. It's in the middle of Taiwan Actually, there's there's nothing to be shown there. And it's very uh, the whole scenery is, is terrible in a way. But but for those directors, they are able to present to let us see, especially for those um, uh, urban urban audience like me. Um, it gives me another opportunity, another new perspective to find out what Taiwan really looks like. So it's. It's a real opportunity for me, or even for other audience like me, to uh, rediscover uh, Taiwan again. So the same thing happened in uh, Little Big Women in uh, in this year, Gu Wei. In these movies, uh, it deals with very traditional Taiwanese husband-wife relationship and also mother-daughter relationships. And that kind of story about how mother uh, raise up uh, her uh, children, her daughters, or how a wife, after finding that her husband had an extra marital affairs and deserted the family and lost for more than 20 years. That is a very common, actually very common stories in uh, Taiwanese societies, but it has not been presented in on this screen. So, by presenting or by showing uh, little big women films like this, audience um, once again will be identified with issues showing on big screen. It's very it's been a long time that Taiwan 
cinema, in a way, we can say that Taiwan cinema is far away from the touch of the audience. Because in the era of new Taiwan cinema, audience cannot be connected with those films. The, the uh, issues, the political issues or historical issues uh, on screen, uh, the audience feel that kind of stories are a little bit remote from their daily life. But for those new directors or the recent uh, trends of filmmaking practice for those films, they are able to bring up those local issues such as uh, Zhong Po Sai or such as uh, in Little Big Women. Those films give, give Taiwanese audience another opportunity to recognize those films are really their own films. The stories on big screen are their own stories. So that's why in um, in this film, Little Big Women, nowadays they are, they are record-breaking. Record the box office is getting higher and higher because a lot of audience after watching the film, especially a female audience after watching the film, they will bring back their, for instance, their grandma or their mother or even mother bring uh, her daughters back to theater and watch again. So as a way to reflect their own a mother-daughter relationship, or the way to reflect uh, the the relationship among family members. So this is a very good uh, tendency, or it's a very um, good sign that Taiwan cinema once again goes back to the heart of Taiwan audience. They will be able to um, to feel those stories are their own stories. So I think. That's a good uh, positive sign after the COVID-19 happening all over the world. And in Taiwan, since we're so isolated from the rest of the world, so our film directors will be able to show those films and audience. Actually, there's no Hollywood movies. So they, will, they watch, the more they watch Taiwan movies, the more they will be able to identify um, Taiwan cinema. And I think that's a good thing. And I really hope this kind of phenomena can continue maybe till next year or forever. Okay, basically that's my uh, show presentation. And then on the other hand, I would like to answer uh, Gina's question. She asked, uh, what is the current state of women's filmmaking in Taiwan? I must say nowadays, uh, women's filmmakers are very vibrant in documentary area. A lot of uh, female documentary uh, filmmakers, they are making their new films, like uh, Zheng Wenzhen or uh, Zheng Huilin, a lot of uh, female directors making a uh, new uh, documentary nowadays. And then the organization of women make waves, they are doing very well because they have been they have become a very fo a formal organization. They are doing film festival every year. So it's been recognized as a very important um, film uh, festivals every year. And then for the archive, National Archive, they have been, right now they, are, they, are, they have been, uh, uh, restore some important female directors' work, such as Li Mei Mi. Uh, that's a very important female directors, and right now they are uh, trying to uh, restore and uh, uh, digitize her uh, works. And now uh, later on, I believe her work will be uh, uh, made into DVD or some other form, so that um, we will be like Tai uh, Yipian, and we will have more opportunity to study those films made by um, um, female directors. Oh, so that that would be my uh, short answers to Tina's question. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Um, I'm really glad to see you know so many films from Taiwan. As all of them, I really want to watch. Um, and also, thank you for addressing uh, Gina's question. So now we'll open um, to the floor. I know the um, this particular platform don't have raise hand uh, function. So I think we just use the uh, chat box as our cue. So I think for now, I will just um, give the microphone to uh, Carrie Poon. She uh, posed two questions just now, one to Chris and one to Dawei. So Carrie, if you're still here, maybe you can speak. Um, I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Do 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 you want me to start my video as well so they can see me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you see me? 
Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've posted uh, two questions to Chris and um, Dawei. So um, I would like to hear some response, very uh, uh, inspiring responses from both of you. Thank you very much. Um, but do you want me to repeat the question or it's all in the chat box? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay, I think. Okay. So your question is really about the different, to me, is about the different responses in Europe. Yeah, and yeah. Um, how people have reacted to the Taiwanese language films. I think it's very hard to generalize. Um, from my experience, it depends a lot on the particular audience that the films are going to. But what I do want to say is that I think it's very important to prepare them properly because of the incredible um, long-term impact of Taiwan new cinema since the 1980s and 1990s. It's true that audiences in Europe who know anything about Taiwan cinema think they're going to be seeing art films. Hmm. So you have to say to them, this is not going to be an art film. In fact, it's going to be very low budget. So it's going to be a very relaxed experience for you. It's not... Um, that kind of experience you associate with our film. But as we've screened it across different um, countries, different uh, environments, universities, film festivals, cinematechs, and so on, we find, you know, depends on the audience. If they're very much a cinephile audience, they're tuned into things like, oh, you know, these some of these youth films uh, dealing with youth social problems remind us of Japanese Sun Tribe films from a few years before. And then they ask questions about production and so on. Other audiences who are studying more about Taiwan are more interested in the social issues. Sometimes I also get asked whether, you know, there are different reactions in different countries. And I don't think it's a national thing. Um, with maybe one little exception, I will say, which is, both for the first tour and the second tour, a place where we had a lot of success with Lithuania. And in Lithuania, in both cases, we start with a small audience and then the second night, bigger audience, third night, even bigger and so on. And what we discovered, of course, is in Lithuania, they understand what it means to have a big brother neighbor and they understand what it means to have a population from that country in their country as well. Um, and all the complicated language questions, you know, Russian and Lithuanian are even more different than Minnanhua and Met and Goyu. Um, so it resonated for them very naturally. But I think maybe everywhere else isn't, there's no, no special connection like that. I hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's just because I am interested in Cantonese films as well. Um, in Hong Kong, the uh, film archive, they've done a very good research and then they've preserved a lot of Cantonese films which were produced between mainly between 1940s and 1970s, before 1970s. And I'm just see, trying to see a chance to promote these films overseas. And so if uh, after seeing your effort, maybe it gives me some inspiration, maybe if I'm going to do it in the future, or study it in the future, and maybe I will promote it or under a theme. Uh, because there are so many things we can talk about in Cantonese theme, films, um, maybe about a representation of a certain kind of identities. Uh, they can be political, uh, they can be uh, uh, sexuality. And um, so um, your experience helps me a lot. And thank you very much, Chris. And uh, that way, uh, uh, when I when I when I saw your uh, your presentation, I'm I'm very interested in knowing your view on the representation of masculinity, because I study masculinity in certain Taiwan Taiwanese films. And mm -hmm. when I came across the Thai UPN uh, period, Ming, uh, Ming Ye uh, inspired me with this question. Uh, I I and then I saw it as well. Um, a lot of men were described as impotent or yeah. at least weak. So yeah. I, it's not a certain kind of disability, but in a way they were. Yeah. Really, so yeah. did you have the same, same uh, per perception as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Kerry. Uh, as you know, uh, Tai Yu Pian is basically is an open about 
lower class people. Uh, many of them um, live in poverty. And um, because of this, uh, most of the characters in Tai Yu Pian frustrated, whether they are men, male or female, whether they are adults or children. So, um, uh, yes, many men are weak and uh, important, but uh, uh, I think that uh, um, um, I, I think that um, that's what might be especially interesting to you is that some uh, guys uh, stand up because they are comedians. They are they are all clownish comedians, so that they try to express sense of humor despite the difficulties in life. And um, uh, in fact, during the Taiyu PM period, the most successful star are the clowns. Um, I mean, who, are, uh, who pretend to be stupid and uh, they are especially uh, popular among the audience. And um, uh, of course, there are many handsome stars, handsome actors in Tai Yu Pian, but basically they are frustrated lovers and they are, um, they are good to look at, but uh, not that they don't attract a special attention. Usually women and the clowns are especially um, uh, fascinating in Tai Yu Pian. So I think maybe it's also the case in, in Hong Kong because we know that the comedies uh, have been very popular and then, uh, in, in Hong Kong for, yeah, so all history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your inspirational answers. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, Robert, you have questions, Chris. Well, yeah, actually, I already typed my question on, on the discussion board, but I do, uh, I'd like to um, also answer Carrie's questions. She asked, um, there are some important male characters in uh, Tai Yu Pian. So in a way, we can say, uh, if we um, look at those Tai Yu Pian closely, uh, especially <laughs> film made by Lin Tuan Chiu, uh, I would say those films actually have some kind of female empowerment. Because at, um, in Lin Tuan Chiu's movies, those female characters, even though they are in a very weak and very marginal positions, but once they have the opportunity, they will stand up to even protect their uh, uh, male counterpart. So uh, we might look at those Tai Yu Pian uh, from a female or feminist perspectives. And my question for Chris is like, uh, um, actually, it's, it's, it's also a, a issue, an issue debate debated in Taiwan, because those uh, restored Tai Yu Pian nowadays only circulate on campus, on university campus. And we are trying to promote those films uh, to let them face in the general audience and also let the audience, especially for younger generation, knowing that we have that kind of uh, old black and white, but very interesting um, Tai Yu Pian available for them. But I really doubt if the audience uh, will be able to accept that kind of film, especially for uh, audience outside of uh, Taiwan, because they had that kind of preconception that Taiwan is famous for making our movies. They won't be uh, very difficult to imagine that kind of film will be coming out of Taiwan. And what do you think, Chris? Uh, I mean, I saw your question, and, and actually this is also a comment for Carrie and her <laughs> ideas about, you know, the Cantonese language films from Hong Kong, from the 50s and so on. Um, I think that the audiences, if you're talking about mainstream general audiences, yeah, you know, old British films are not shown in British movie theaters either. But, um, you know, I think it's possible that audiences, if you introduce things properly and slowly, if you don't, if you don't expect that immediately it's going to get into a huge festival or a huge venue, or be shown, you know, by the British Film Institute or whatever. If you do it in a kind of strategic way, it's possible to break that image and get a more diversified image out there to the audience. And that's why, in retrospect, I think um, things like using DVDs to show things in universities or other kinds of venues like that is a way to start. Karada has just put this link to yeah. a case of the Taiwan B movies 
I think similarly, using things like streaming um, to create uh, interest and to make the films available is all a good way of doing it. But you have to start small. I guess that's what I would like to say. People want to kind of just have instant impact, but you've got to build. And you know, it isn't instant. But I think it's possible. If I, I may not add, but uh, just personal experience, I was talking to a uh, Taiwanese friend and she's not specifically a cinephile. And then he pointed out how many things are on Netflix. I don't have any action on Netflix and it's very problematic. We've seen with the pandemic, with, with movies uh, distributed directly uh, on HBO Max, etc. cetera. So I, I, I'm, the reconfiguration of cinema, it's something where maybe Taiwan film as well can play a part. Just here, we have, um, we have this, this Vimeo showcase it's free in Europe, I guess it's worldwide and limited, something that might be interesting also for our future reflection, like limited time, which is like two weeks. So it's kind of event, right? But yet, but yet two weeks to see this, this movie for free, which are not just shown, but also if you go to the, to the website, there are uh, uh, intervention, academic or, or documentary. So there is a, a, a frame, a context. And the Netflix thing, we discussed the detention uh, TV show, but at the same time you have A Son by Tom Mohon. So it, it, also the barrier between art and, and, and horror movies are, are, are blurred. So maybe there is something on the online screening, if it, if, you know, it breaks the heart because we love movie theater, but there are things that can be done and mixing. Uh, mm -hmm. Ancient black white, contemporary art like Tom Hong and your name, uh, whatever terrain is going to be breezed as well at the end of the month. So there's a huge visibility of Taiwan movies, both ancient and, and contemporary. It's something that the university's cultural equator can add, hopefully. Mm. Okay, yeah. Corrado, have you finished? Okay, right. Because I think some of the um, sometimes the the the, the votes get disrupted. Okay, so we have um, many questions. Um, some many of them were posted um, when people register. So I'm not very sure if the person who asked the question are actually here. And if we don't go through the questions, um, we will certainly try to answer them individually by email after the event. But I don't know if anybody here has more questions to ask. Maybe one Maybe. final question before we wrap up. Or comments? Also, the last okay. question, sorry. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, I was listening to what Chris said, and also the question raised by uh, Carrie. I was just wondering, when we introduce such an uh, alternative uh, genre or alternative uh, <laughs> options for the audience, do you are the main audience uh, for Thai UPN try to appeal to? Uh, this is not really where we screen it, because as uh, Chris explained, there's a lot of uh, practical constraints. So we really want to show this too, in order to make this, uh, if not a big impact, but at least uh, having some kind of a lingering impact or, or entice people to this kind of interest. And how, how Taiwanese audience responded to uh, these old films, these uh, low budget black and white, they've forgotten films. Thank you. I think there's a lot of different things there, but um, my understanding is, as Robert was saying a bit earlier, that there have been a lot of efforts in Taiwan to try to reach out to younger audiences, but so far they haven't been so successful. Um, I think that in when it comes to 
you know, and, and maybe it's necessary, sorry, just to say, you need to think about new kinds of uh, screening venues, using streaming platforms, um, using social media a lot more, and try to generate a buzz in that way, I think. Um, as for in Europe, I think, or it depends, I would use that stakeholder configuration term again. And I would say that different stakeholders want the films to be successful in different places, right? So I think the Taiwan reps office here and also probably Taiwan uh, Audiovisual and Film Institute really want high profile venues like um, I know the London Film Festival or, um, you know, the Cinémathèque Française, these kinds of very high profile venues that they can get press coverage with. Um, and so I've been trying to say, I think it's hard to go in there at once. You have to take some steps and that's a big change because I think maybe just two, you know, a decade or two ago, those were venues where things were discovered. But I had a very interesting conversation with Wafa Germani from the Cinematheque Francaise, who does screen a lot of Taiwanese films there. And she said that in France, it's still true that when the Cinematheque Francaise screens something, it says to the film culture world, this is important. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's true so much in the UK anymore. I think that the BFI just screens films for old people, to be honest with you. Um, they kill me for saying that, but their main audience is, you know, older folks. And the discoveries are actually happening in smaller, much hipper festivals in London and events, you know, that, that happen every year. Um, so there are differences, again, from country to country. Right. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for that answer. And I think actually this is right on time when we should finish. So I think I would just use this opportunity to thank all our speakers. And also I'd like to thank uh, all the participants and in particular host Diane, who have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to facilitate this event. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, thank you for coming to our webinar and hope you'll watch this space for future events and um, hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, yeah, so see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs> again, bye-bye. everybody. Bye. Okay, I'm up now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.